Welcome back. I don't waste your time. Let's get straight into it. Andy Jassy, the current CEO of Amazon.com, just released his third ever letter to shareholders. So we're going to be covering some key insights into what he thinks uh, about the future of AI and the explosive year that they just had in 2023. Uh, additionally, Andy Jassy went on to CNBC to speak with Andrew Sorkin. So we'll look at some commentary that Andrew Sorkin had to have about uh, his interview, as well as, of course, the uh, clip of the interview itself. Yeah, she talks about Anthropic um, in this. I, I did go ahead and watch about a minute of it, but it was too good. So I, I stopped it there so that we could cover it together. Of course, I should preface this by saying that I do have a pretty big stake in Amazon.com. It roughly accounts for 35% of my invested capital. So it, it is quite a significant stake. Of course, I'm a little bit biased. So I, I should mention that this is dated April 5th, but um, I haven't changed the allocations or anything. This is exactly how it is uh, today. So let's not waste any more time. Uh, let's dive into the clips. Seems to happen at the same time. And we're just uh, going to bring this to you right now because it just came out. Amazon uh, CEO Andy Jassy uh, releasing his annual letter uh, to shareholders. And we want to just bring you some notes from it. I'm sure we'll talk a lot about it when we uh, speak to him a little later in the broadcast. He's striking a much more optimistic tone uh, in this letter than in the prior year, which, as I mentioned earlier, uh, had been a challenging one. They had been uh, navigating some layoffs. They had uh, done a massive restructuring around the distribution centers. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Amazon stock now trading near all time highs. And it has been quite a turnaround. Uh, the investment Amazon making in its delivery networks and artificial intelligence appear to be paying off. AI, the big theme of this year's letter, as you might imagine, uh, Jassy writing, quote, we are optimistic that much of this world uh, changing AI will be built on top of AWS. And of course, there's been questions about Microsoft and uh, what it's been doing with open AI and uh, what Google is doing. But uh, he says he believes, quote, that generative AI may be the largest technology transformation since the cloud and perhaps since the Internet. We heard something very similar, by the way, uh, from Jamie Dimon in his uh, annual letter uh, just uh, last week. Part of the strategy is Amazon's uh, effort to compete in the chips business. He goes into some depth in the letter about uh, what that means. And it's worth taking a look, uh, if you do follow Amazon, uh, what they're thinking about as it relates to chips. On AWS, uh, on the sales side, Jassy saying that he's seeing improvements. Uh, while uh, 2022 companies were trying to save money, he said uh, that uh, by the end of 2023, he saw, quote, cost optimization attenuating, new deals accelerating, and customers renewing at larger commitments over longer time periods. And okay, I'm going to stop it right here. This is a very interesting quote. Um, again, I, I hadn't watched this part of the video until until now, but he said, um, as Andrew Sorkin read it, by the end of 2023, we saw cost optimization, new deals accelerating. This is very important. So new deals accelerating. If you didn't know, uh, AWS, it, it was this big thing about, about a year ago, I want to say, where uh, AWS revenue slowed down to roughly the low teens ish and the stock tanked massively, right? Uh, big surprise of uh, cloud spend going down. At the same time, Microsoft was chugging along. So you had uh, AWS slow down and Google uh, Cloud slowing down and stuff like that. Meanwhile, uh, Microsoft was chugging along. So the narrative was that M uh, sorry, Microsoft is taking away market share from Google and Amazon. But this is very interesting. So we see that software spend as a whole was slowing down with the whole 2022 debacle of uh, layoffs and uh, just ge general economy slowdown and stuff like that. This is very interesting that the CEO himself is now saying that they think that there's going to be an acceleration in new deals. And of course, um, it mentions customers renewing at larger commitments over longer time periods. So we're going to basically to dumb it down, he said that they're going to retain the current customer base and that customer base is going to spend more with them. And on top of that, they think there's going to be an acceleration in new people signing up for AWS. This is wonderful news. But anyways, I'm going to keep playing it here. Remember, he made it very easy for people to sort of turn on, uh, you know, up the dial, lower the dial. Some people thought he should keep it, you know, in, you know almost force the customer to, to, to keep on the dial. And he said, you know, if you give them the option, they're going to come back when things get better. And it appears he's saying that, they, that it is. Meantime, Amazon has also changed, as I mentioned, the delivery network to this regional model to bring products closer to customers. Um, if you are a customer, you might imagine that you've been getting uh, your packages a little bit quicker. Uh, Jassy's saying that shift has not just got the, the uh, packages to folks more quickly, but it's brought costs per unit down to 45 cents. Okay, I'm going to stop this one right here as well. Uh, it says more than 7 billion, wow, 7 billion items arriving same or next day. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's cut off there. Uh, increase of 70% year over year. That's incredible. In the US, cost to serve down by 45 cents. So I, I did read a little bit of the letter as well. And um, they actually mentioned how uh, for the first time ever since I think maybe 2016 or something like that, 
or I think it was 2018, since first time ever since 2018, um, on a year on year basis, their per unit cost of like delivering or whatever has went down, which is very interesting. So it's costing Amazon less per unit uh, of getting it delivered per unit. It's costing them less to d deliver every package and whatever, which is like the first time it's happened since 2018. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how they calculate that. I'm sure they detail it in the letter when we go to take a look in a second. In the United States, also the number of items delivered same day or overnight increased by almost, ready for this, 70%. That's actually a remarkable thing, and they're beating their own uh, numbers from the past. Yes, On the advertising business, uh, that is a big grower. It grew 24% year over year to $47 billion. And then I'm sure in the media world, people are going to focus. So he just kind of brushed off the advertising thing. I'm almost certain that's more in revenue from the advertising that Amazon does, 47 billion. We could even pull it up here. I, I think maybe Netflix revenue, 2023. Yeah, so Netflix does about 34 billion, which everyone knows Netflix is an absolute juggernaut of a business, right? Netflix does about 34 billion in revenue with all their subscribers and everything. And then you have the Amazon ads business doing roughly what, 50% more in revenue than the entire business of Netflix. So Amazon, by just putting a tiny little word sponsored at the bottom of every uh, search that you do on Amazon, if you didn't know the ads business for Amazon, it's not just Twitch or whatever. Every time you search uh, whatever item it is, so maybe like an iPhone charger or like an iPhone phone case or whatever, the first four items, it says sponsored under that. So someone paid to have their product be showed at like the top priority. And when you search... Uh, their uh, their uh, product is prioritized over other products. And that little word sponsored does $47 billion in revenue. And it's growing at 24%, I think uh, Andrew Sorkin said. But anyways, very interesting that uh, he kind of just like brushes it off. He says, yeah, I had business at 47 billion in revenue, right? Anyways, moving on. Focus on this one sentence in the letter, Jesse writing, we quote, uh, have increasing conviction that Prime Video can be a large and profitable business on its own. So we will uh, dive into all of this when we speak with Amazon CEO Andy Jassy coming up at 8.30. Uh, e 8.30 Eastern. Yeah, so uh, it's currently 10.30 Eastern. Um, so this is the second clip where they actually uh, talk about uh, Anthropic and some, some other stuff. So we'll, uh, we'll dive right into this one as well. Do you think you could buy a firm like Anthropic? Oh, also, I was gonna mention, um, the videos are sped up just for the sake of time in this environment from a regulatory perspective? I don't know. I mean, Do you think you could buy a firm like Anthropic in this environment from a regulatory perspective? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's I think we've got to be careful right now in Western countries in the way that we're handling regulation. I think a really good example of that is what happened with iRobot, if you follow that. You yep. know? So I think it's it, it's a really kind of a sad story. It, it, it's a great entrepreneurship story where you had this, um, you know, this American company that invented this product, invented, invented the category, and built a business that was almost a billion dollars in, in revenue. And whenever you build a good business, you end up with company and competition. So they track these two very large Chinese companies as, as competitors, and they need to scale because scale lets you buy components at the right price and invest in R&D. So they merge with Amazon, and the European Commission um, right. blocks it because they worry that we're going to feature our uh, vacuum cleaner, you know, their, their right. Roomba versus others, which of course is not our model because we make actually at least as much money selling third-party items as our own. But they block it, and then immediately after they block it, the FTC comes out and says, oh, we would have blocked it if, if they hadn't. And so what happens? We abdicate the acquisition. Uh, iRobot lays off a third of its staff. The stock price completely tanks. And now is a real question whether they're going to be a going concern. Turns out with these uh, in-house... So if you didn't know, iRobot is the vacuum cleaner. I believe they have uh, the, the Roomba. So I'm, I'm sure you guys know what that is, the Roomba here. This little thing that kind of goes around your house and it clean, cleans it up. Um, so a Amazon wanted to acquire the iRobot business. And it's, it's a money-losing business, right? And what Jassy is saying is... Uh, the thing that iRobot struggled with was uh, meeting scale and having big scale to get cheaper parts and uh, a distribution. And of course, if, if they were to be purchased by Amazon, they wouldn't have to worry about uh, massive ad spend, right? So they have to do all this marketing and uh, all these ads to try to get people or get their product in front of people and whatever. If they were to be on Amazon, they would just get priority and uh, maybe Amazon would uh, display them more and so on and so forth, right? Um, and what he said, the deal was blocked by the EU. And what's interesting is he's saying that the EU is essentially saying that it makes more sense for Amazon who takes care of their data and whatever. Well, uh, we're taking the CEO's word here at face value, but uh, takes care of the data and so on. And instead, they're okay with 
Chinese um, robot vacuum companies and whatever. Anyways, he goes on to explain uh, the, the data part here. Vacuum cleaners, they have to map the inside of your house. That's why they, right. they don't run into a table or a chair. So really what Western regulators were saying was that they trust these two large Chinese companies with maps of the inside of U.S. consumers' homes more than they do Amazon, even though we've been an amazing steward of customer data in our retail business and for AWS, where customers, right. both those businesses will tell you that. That's, that. So, okay. Again, this is the CEO's words, and he's saying they're, they're a great steward of customer data and so on. Who knows if that actually has any validity to it? Um, nonetheless, from, and I'm not an American, but from an American perspective, Obviously, you would want an American company having uh, the, the data inside, like ma mapping the inside of a house compared to, uh, it doesn't even matter if it's China, just having a, a foreign company have that type of data. So uh, again, a little bit interesting that the EU and America are, are blocking this uh, and, and allowing their, their foreign counterparts, right? can't be what we were going for. And right. so I think people don't know what they can do right now. And I just think we've got to try and find a way to be reasonable in what we're doing. You know, the FTC is looking into even the partnership that you have with Anthropic. They're looking at the way Microsoft's relationship uh, exists with OpenAI. I'm sure they're going to look at Microsoft's uh, sort of aqua hire deal. I don't know what you think of that uh, as it relates to inflection. I mean, it's very interesting what's happening. Nobody's making outright acquisitions, but in some ways these partnerships are in lieu of that. No? Yeah, I mean, there, there are some acquisitions happening, but we're, you know, we're consuming a lot of time and, and taxpayers' money with what we're doing right now, and I think a lot of it is outside the bounds of the law right now. Outside the bounds of the law in terms think, of how far you think, think the regulators are going? I think the, that you know, some of these organizations are making decisions that are outside the bounds of the law. Um, let me ask you this. Since we're on the topic of, of regulation, I want to get into what you've done with uh, sellers over the past year and just what's happening uh, on the consumer side of the platform, which is a remarkable thing. This is incredible. Uh, I, can't, I can't wait to get his answer on this and the question. Given how you change the distribution uh, model and like, and you now have more sellers on the platform than ever. But at the same time, you have the FTC out there saying that you are a, a monopoly, uh, that uh, one out of every two dollars uh, that a seller on the platform uh, is, is, is getting is going back to you uh, in the context of advertising, uh, servicing the distribution and, and the like. What do, you, what do you make of that? Well, I think you got to start with facts, you know, and, and if you look at uh, on Amazon, over 60 percent of the units we sell are sold by third party sellers. Um, so, you know, it's not hard to actually create software to put up an e-commerce website or, or storefront. It's much harder to get distribution and access to customers, which is what Amazon gives uh, right. sellers. You know, our sellers uh, on average sell about $230,000 um, in our marketplace. We have thousands of sellers who sell over a million dollars a year in our marketplace. So sellers are making a lot more money selling on Amazon than they could on their own. You know, then if you look at things like Fulfillment by Amazon, which is our service that allows you to store your products with Amazon, and we'll pick back and ship it for you, and it also is available for prime shipping, that saves uh, sellers over 70% from having to do it themselves. So we, it right. costs money, so we charge a fee for it, but it's much more cost effective for sellers. And while there's always things we can be doing better for sellers, and we work really hard at it, we have a great relationship with sellers. Is it a better business, you think, to have a third party marketplace or to have a first party? He kind of sidestepped that, um, didn't really answer the whole monopoly thing. Right up. You notice that with a lot of, um, especially Andy Jassy, uh, I think at the start of the video, he got asked about uh, Anthropic, possibly buying Anthropic, made absolutely no mention, started talking about iRobot, um, right? The, the video was titled about abandoning the iRobot deal and so on. But uh, yeah, and I'm kind of disappointed in the answer. He kind of sidestepped uh, talking about the, the whole sellers thing. They did, if you didn't know, increased um, the, I believe, like the, the warehouse fees by something like three, four times. Like literally overnight um so that, that's what andrew sorkin was referring to and it is true if so opening up a e-commerce storefront like off of shopify i i did it in the matter of a day right and i, I just pulled some mugs or whatever and uh, took the pictures off of alibaba and just put them right into the shopify website developer thing um so it, it's not difficult by any means i think literally anyone with access to internet with a computer could do that but he is right in the fact that amazon has 250 million Prime members that go on to Amazon daily and they type exactly what they want. And if your product happens to be one of the first five, six items there, you're making a living, right? And so it's, it's Amazon selling the distribution of having access to millions and millions of customers, hundreds of millions of customers. And that is ultimately the value proposition that Amazon brings. So I, I think they should be able to charge for something like that. And Sorkin said, uh, they, the Amazon makes roughly 50% um, or out of every $2 spent, they make back a dollar. That, uh, that is, it can be further from the truth. So he's saying that for every $2 
uh, Amazon doesn't have 50% net margins. I think what he actually means is um, the ads and all that type of stuff. They're, they're making a decent sum of money, but I, I highly doubt it's even close to 50% margins. So let's watch the end of this clip and then we'll move on to the letter. Party marketplace. Given, given no, and it's very, you know, if you look at just the, the margin and the fees that, that you've been able to accumulate from, from third parties, is that a better business? Is it less capital intensive? Is it more capital intensive? It's a very good question. They're both really interesting businesses. Uh, you know, on the one of the main reasons that we have a first party uh, business is that it allows us to make sure for the items that customers care a lot about um, that otherwise wouldn't happen, that, that you can keep the prices as low as possible for customers and keep the in-stock levels the way you want. But wherever we have third party sellers who are selling, um, it's always a great value proposition. And, and, you know, they sell the majority of the units for us now. There's a lot of sameness among. Anyways. IBKR is actually the broker I use, but uh, we're not sponsored, so. <laughs> but yeah, uh, he does mention that the first party sales uh, mostly has to do with like very cheap items. So like your, your toothpaste and diapers and stuff like that, um, where they, they just want breadth of product. So they want to make sure that they have a, a large variety of products being sold. Some of those more not very profitable products, so the, like your toothpaste and whatever, they want to make sure that they have uh, appropriate stock levels to be able to deliver um, consistently and all that type of stuff. Moving on, this is a very long read. So I'm kind of just going to go through um, the, uh, what's it called? I'm, I'm going to go through like the, the initial paragraph here and then also we'll search for some key terms as we go on. He goes on to start by saying, Dear shareholders, last year at this time, I shared my enthusiasm and op optimism for Amazon's future. Today, I have even more. The reasons are many, but start with the progress we've made in our financial results and customer experiences and extend to our continued innovation and remarkable opportunities in front of us. Remarkable opportunities in front of us. <clears throat> Anthropic. Uh, in 2023, Amazon's total revenue grew by 12%. So they want to do some uh, revenue stuff. Uh, further, Amazon's operating income and free cash flow dramatically improved. Operating income in 2023 improved 200%. That's not a typo. From uh, $12 billion to $37 billion. Um, and of course, their margins expanded roughly triple as well. Uh, trailing 12 month free cash flow adjusted, not sure why they adjusted for finance leases, improved from negative $13 billion to roughly $36 billion. Yeah, so it's an it's a almost $50 billion swing in free cash flow from negative to all the way up to 36 ish. Um, We've made meaningful progress in our financial measures. What we're most pleased about is the continued customer experience improvements across our business. In our stores business, we continue to have the broadest retail selection. This is true. They have millions and millions of products. I think they actually outline it here. Uh, with hundreds of millions of products available, tens of millions added last year alone, and several premium brands starting to list on Amazon, Coach, Victoria's Secret, or Clinique, interesting. That's a, that's a very popular makeup brand, I believe. Um, being sharp on price is always important, but particularly in an uncertain economy where customers are careful about how much they're spending. As a result, Q4, talk about the holiday, customers are nearly 24 billion across millions of deals and coupons, almost 70% more than the prior year. I'd be interested to, so 70% increase in what, total items sold maybe? We also continue to improve delivery speeds, breaking multiple company records. And they outline, yeah, 7 billion items arriving same day or next day, including 4 billion in the U.S. Combination of two things. One is the benefit of regionalization, where we re-architected the network to store items close to customers. So I guess this ties into the whole operational efficiency thing that they're really diving deep into. If you didn't know, and I outlined this in my last video on Amazon, they had um, their CapEx, or sorry, their, their fulfillment network doubled in I think it was around two and a half, three-ish years. So between 2020 to 2023, 2022 or whatever, um, their fulfillment network doubled. So they had built up this fulfillment network over the past 20 years, whatever. And in the span of two years, um, they built out exactly the same amount, or I, I guess they, they doubled it. I keep mentioning it. Um, so they had a crazy amount of CapEx, which we'll dive into in a second here. That's why the free cash flow went negative. Um, but as I mentioned in the last video, I, I think um, they moved more towards cost cutting and operational efficiencies, whereby in the COVID period, due to a spike in demand, they had to overbuild, and this is the CEO's words, not mine, they had to overbuild on fulfillment just to meet that demand and hopefully grow into it, uh, which is today. They've, they've grown into it and they're kind of cutting down on these costs. 
Regionalization efforts have also trimmed transportation distances, helping lower our cost to serve. Again, I isn't exactly what I was just saying. In 2023, for the first time ever since 2018, we reduced our cost to serve on a per unit basis globally. In the U.S. alone, cost to serve was down by more than 45 cents per unit. The over year decreasing cost to serve allows us to both invest in speed improvements and afford adding more selection at lower average selling prices. More selection at lower prices puts us in consideration for more purchases. Flywheel. That's, that's the one word that just comes to mind. This is the Amazon flywheel. They become more efficient, which allows them to sell more at lower prices, which just ties all the way back in. This is the age old Amazon flywheel. Beautiful stuff to see. As we look towards 2024 and beyond, we're not done lowering our cost to serve. Continued flywheel. <laughs> We've challenged every close, closely held belief in our fulfillment network and reevaluated every part of it and found several areas where we believe we can lower costs even further while also delivering faster for our customers. Our inbound fulfillment architecture and resulting inventory placement are areas of focus 2024, and we have optimism there's more room for upside. So the tripling in free cash flow margins was not a fluke by any means. This is completely intentional. The Amazon management has looked far and wide and looked to cost to, to cut costs and uh, continue leveraging the operational leverage that they have built up over the past two and a half decades. Internationally, he talks about this. I, they're planning on we have high conviction that these new geographies will continue to grow and be profitable in the long run. If you didn't know internationally, Amazon to this day, outside of Canada, I think, um, they're extremely unprofitable. So India, Brazil, uh, the outline here, the Middle East, all these different places, they're not very profitable. Alongside our stores business, Amazon advertising, this is beautiful. I just absolutely love to see this stuff. Alongside our stores business, Amazon advertising progress remains strong, growing 24% year over year, from 38 billion, so around Netflix territory, to 47 billion, just explosive growth. And they, again, they kind of like uh, mentioned this so like as, as if it's a small thing, but you gotta keep in mind, this probably has, I don't know, north of 50, 60% operating margins. So massive contributor to the aforementioned uh, $30 billion in operating income that they have, right? I want to say uh, 47 billion in 2023, driven primarily by our sponsored ads. So when you search a key item in Amazon and it's a sponsor at the bottom, we've added sponsor TV to this offering, a self-service solution for brands to create campaigns that can appear on, on up to 30 plus streaming TV services, including Amazon Freebie, Twitch, and and have no minimum spend. Recently, we've expended our streaming TV advertising by introducing ads into Prime Video shows and movies where brands can reach over 200 million monthly viewers in our most popular entertainment offerings. Across hit movies and shows, award-winning Amazon, MGM Originals, blah, 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 Thursday Night Football, streaming TV, whatever. Um, so if you didn't know, they recently started putting ads and analysts have predicted that that roughly adds five-ish billion dollars in operating income. So just like that, overnight, they've added um, five billion dollars. And this kind of speaks to a larger thing with big tech as a whole. They just have so many levers of monetization where you could do so many different things to literally overnight uh, increase bottom line profits, right? So in the case of Amazon, um, within a day or within a month, however long it took to uh, actually get those ads rolling, They've just created five, six billion dollars of operating income out of thin air, right? And same thing with Apple, right? They increase the prices on iCloud and it immediately adds ten billion dollars of profit, just like that. And what are you going to do? Stop using iCloud, right? Or uh, e even with their um, iTunes subscription, right? So there's an element of pricing power and levers of monetization that big tech benefits from, just because of the sheer size that they operate on. Of course, the engine of the business, AWS. Shifting to AWS, we started 2023 seeing substantial substantial cost optimization with most companies trying to save money in an uncertain economy. So this speaks to a larger thing where in 2023, as I mentioned, um, we saw a massive slowdown in AWS and Google Cloud spend where it went from a 20 something percent grower to only a, only a, a low teens grower. Much of this cost optimization was catalyzed by AWS helping customers use the cloud more efficiently and leverage more powerful price performance AWS capabilities, the gravitization chips, 
blah, blah, blah. 40% better price performance than other leading S3. Anyways, a bunch of tech jargon. It says, this work diminished short-term revenue, but was best for customer, much appreciated, and should bode well for customers in AWS longer term. By the end of 2023, we saw cost optimization attenuating, it's a big word, uh, new deals accelerating, customers renewing at larger commitments over longer time periods, and migrations growing again. This is amazing. So by sacrificing short-term revenue, they've essentially locked in these customers into AWS, and this has created higher lifetime value for those customers. I mean, th this is the age-old Amazon concept, right? You want to sacrifice the short term and get the customers on board in the case of uh, the prime subscription as a key example, just so you have the lifetime value of the customer be exceedingly high just because you've built that goodwill with the customer. The past year was also a significant delivery year for AWS. We announced Graviton 4, whatever, better compute, blah, 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 tech jargon. We're also making progress on many of our newer businesses. And then they, they go on to talk about Prime Video and some of the smaller businesses here. I, I don't think it matters too much. Um, but long story short, the idea that I'm getting out of reading this letter so far, which by the way, we're only a fourth of the way down. So this video would go north of one hour if we were to go through the whole thing. But um, the idea that I'm getting out of it is we're seeing reacceleration in AWS because uh, last year was a little bit softer on the software spend type of uh, so software spend side of things. Um, so we're seeing reacceleration there. Uh, we're seeing record uh, compute abilities coming out of AWS. Ads business is absolutely on fire with uh, no slowdown in sight. And we're seeing margin expansion on the retail business and uh, possible profitability international. So you're just seeing across the main four businesses, international, uh, US e-commerce, AWS and ads, on all fronts, Amazon is just firing off on all cylinders. I, I couldn't be more happy and ecstatic about the future of Amazon. Moving on, I just wanted to quickly, if you didn't know, highlight the free cash flow of Amazon. Of course, Amazon was free cash flow negative in um, 2021 and 2022 due to the aforementioned uh, massive capex cycle that they went through in order to build out their fulfillment during the COVID period. And over here, I've outlined on in the blue the <clears throat> excuse me the forward price to free cash flow of Amazon. So as you can see, it's um, historically been significantly higher, but on a forward basis, we're only looking at maybe around thirty-one times uh, price to free cash flow. Of course, this isn't adjusted for stock-based compensation. And in a second here, when we go to my uh, spreadsheet, you'll see that I've adjusted it for stock-based compensation. But even adjusting for that, it's roughly a forty-something times. Um, or price of free cash flow, which is pricey, but then again, you're getting a very wide moat business growing incredibly fast with massive, massive operational leverage and margin expansion behind them. So speaking of the spreadsheet, uh, not this one, this is a different one. This is also a different one. Um, <laughs> if you watch my videos, you'll notice I've used some of those in the past, but this is what I'm talking about. So this is um, a methodology that I've come up with personally myself. If you're familiar with the peg ratio, where it takes uh, the PE of the company divided by um, the absolute growth rate of that company. So for example, if you have a PE of 20 and that company is growing at 10% per year, um, then the peg ratio would be uh, two, uh, two times multiple. So I take the same principle and apply it uh, with free cash flow because of course I only care about free cash flow and not earnings. Um, and what we have is Amazon here, I'll, I'll highlight it for you guys, is a company that is estimated to grow at about 20% free cash flow. And they are currently trading at around 45 times stock based comp adjusted uh, price of free cash flow. And that's, of course, on a forward basis. So what you end up with is 45 divided by 22. So you have 45 here divided by 22. And that gives you roughly a 2.04 multiple for Amazon. And then of course, there's some comparisons around here. So SCHG, the growth ETF is roughly around the same and the S&P 500 is all the way at the bottom there. This isn't inaccurate. I couldn't actually find um, our free cash flow figures or, or sorry, I, I couldn't find the uh, proper growth metrics for um, the S&P 500, but the 31 times multiple seems to be roughly accurate. Um, same thing goes for SCHG. Um, this isn't exact figures, but should serve as like a rough guide. But as you can see, Amazon trading at roughly a 45 times forward multiple and they're growing exceedingly fast. I 
don't think I came out with a video saying I was buying, but I was buying half the amount of Amazon and around the 170 price. So if we just type in 170 here, you see that it lights up green. So at the time that I was buying Amazon, it was a significantly better deal. Um, and of course now it even, even up to, I think 175 when I was buying, it was still under a two times multiple. And I, I believe it was undervalued given the growth prospects that Amazon has so far it's worked out pretty well, but, um, yeah, I think, I think I covered everything. Um, uh, I guess one thing I should mention is, yeah, I'm not really buying Amazon anymore. It's, it's a little bit pricier stocks ran a little bit and to be fair, I do have a pretty massive stake. I am building out the Salesforce Salesforce position. So, I think Salesforce is exceedingly cheap around the $300 mark. So I've built that to a pretty substantial stake as it stands currently. But thank you very much for watching. Have a great day.